This is part one of chapter four, Cases of Pathological Accusation. In Pathological Lying, Accusation, and Swindling by William and Mary Healy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We include in this chapter pathological self-accusation as well as incrimination of others. In court work, one sees many cases of false accusation, but few belong to the pathological variety. We have not considered those based upon vindictiveness or self-defense, or where any other even slight recognizable normal gratification was at the bottom. We have tried to hold strictly to our definition. Selection of the cases for this chapter has been easier than discriminating those who are merely pathological liars in general. It is simpler to distinguish those who accuse others for the purpose of injury or self-protection, or those who make self-accusation under the influence of delusional conditions, than it is to decide upon similar distinctions in cases of mere pathological lying. Several authors, such as Gross, have noted false accusations made during a short period of early adolescence or in connection with menstrual disturbance. Our cases corroborate these facts, but show also that extreme false accusations may be made by girls before puberty. Satisfactory knowledge of such cases is not gained by learning merely that the accuser is under temporary physical stress. It is to be noted that our material clearly shows that there is always more in the background. The many cases observed by us of false accusations made rarely by the feeble-minded and more often by those suffering from psychosis need not be mentioned here. They are obvious in their abnormality and have little bearing upon our immediate problem. For the sake of illustration of the fact of pathological accusation, case 17 is given in this chapter, but in its mental aspects it belongs more properly under the head of borderline cases. In our final deductions, this has not been counted as a mentally normal case. Case 13. Summary. An exceedingly important case from a legal standpoint. A girl of 16 years persistently but falsely accused her own mother and her stepfather of the murder of the youngest child of the family. Some apparent physical corroboration was found. The woman and her spouse were held from the inquest to the grand jury and later were indicted. They were in jail for four months until the case was finally tried when they were discharged. We studied Libby S. as a delinquent some eight months after her mother and stepfather had been acquitted of murder. These unfortunate people had been held and tried almost entirely upon the testimony given by this girl. It goes without saying that they were very poor and not ordinarily self-assertive, and so did not obtain competent legal advice. We were naturally interested in this remarkable affair and were glad to be able to get at the truth of the matter and bring about forgiveness and reconciliation within the family circle. Libby was now under arrest for stealing and for prostitution. Her statement to us was that she had been immoral and wanted to be sent away to an institution where she would be kept out of trouble. She had been working in a factory. Her mother and stepfather were temperate, and the latter was always good to her and to her brother. She told about being extremely nervous when she got to thinking about different things and maintained that she worried so much at times that she did not know what she was going to do. Later we learned from her of her little sister's death, of the fact that the child was not really her sister, and that her mother had not been married to her present husband until the time of the trial, although for long they had been living together. She added that she had been a witness five times in court against her mother and stepfather. A younger brother had also testified against them to some minor extent. Quote, we had to tell what we saw. We told enough lies as it was. End quote. Following the latter remark as a clue, we went as thoroughly as we could into the details of the whole case. No report of the court proceedings being available, we obtained what we could from the newspaper accounts. Obviously, however, much of these were impressionistic and unreliable. The coroner's physician testified to many bruises being on the body and to the bottom of the feet being blistered. The report of what the police said at the inquest was anything but conclusive testimony. Even from that, the murder seemed highly improbable. 
it was shown that a physician was called to the child before she died but did not respond Libby testified at the inquest and later against her mother, stating that the child had been beaten and tortured in various ways. We also learned from other than newspaper sources that when Libby was waiting to testify with her mother suffering imprisonment in the same building, the girl was nonchalantly singing ragtime songs in the courthouse corridors. The facts about the alleged murder of the five-year-old child, as we could finally summarize them from various accounts, and after hearing the confession of Libby, are as follows. This child was an epileptic and had frequent attacks of falling when she injured herself, once having fallen in this way against a hot stove. The little child engaged in extremely bad sex habits. Indeed, Libby herself had been somewhat involved with her in these. Once when she was ill, hot bricks had been placed in the bed, and while unconscious, her feet had been blistered. The child had also suffered from various other ailments, including a skin disease which left sore places and scars. When she died, Libby first told a neighbor that the parents were responsible, and this person referred her to the police. The false testimony began there and continued at the inquest, before the grand jury and at the trial. Upon thorough final sifting of the evidence in court, nothing was found in the least indicating that the child had died from mistreatment. The younger brother had been told by Libby to testify against the mother. There was no question but that Libby started and continued the whole trouble, but the unnatural fact that she was willing to make sworn statements jeopardizing her mother made her testimony have all the earmarks of antecedent probability. The mother herself, in whom we gradually came to have full confidence, informed us that the dead child had an epileptic attack and was unconscious for several hours before she died. They lived on the outskirts of the city and it was bad weather, and although they sent twice for doctors, no one appeared. The child had been mildly whipped at times in an attempt to cure her of her bad sex habits. She had many sores from her skin trouble, and these were by some interpreted as caused by beatings. When under our observation and during our attempts to analyze her career, Libby underwent a change of attitude and confessed thoroughly and definitely that the story about the murder was lies all the way through. For the sake of the poor little mother, we had the girl make a sworn statement to this effect. It was of some little interest to us to note that the police account given in the newspapers about the little child being beaten with a rubber hose was derived from the story told by Libby. It was a wonderfully dramatic and pathetic scene when this mother met her daughter, and the latter confessed to her lies and asked forgiveness. All the mother could say was, quote, Oh, the suffering she has caused me, but I do want her to be a good girl. End quote. From the girl's long stories to us, we may derive the following points of interest. Before her confession, she was very emotional on the subject of her little sister. She dwelled much upon her dreams of the child, but proved self-contradictory about the matter of her death, as well as about her own history. Even then, she began telling us what a bad girl she herself was in various ways. She said, Quote, I did not see Laura die, but I guess they did burn her up because her fingertips were all gone and her hands were all swollen up. Ma said she would burn her up if she did not quit wetting the bed. Yes, I used to worry about Laura awful. She always had been the trouble. I would have been a good girl if it had not been for her. I used to worry so fierce that I could not help from stealing, and then when I stole I was scared to go back to my jobs. I had to have money, and so I made good money by going with these fellows. I used to feel fierce about the money I took from my mother, and used to put it back, and then would say, no, I just must have it, End quote. This girl had been working at different factories and homes since her mother's trial. She confessed to thieving from stores. The stealing she had done at home was, it seems, long before the death of the little child. Libby made much of her mental states and of her dream life in talking to us. Quote, I like to go to nickel shows. I saw a sad piece once, and if I feel sad now, I think about it, and it makes me want to go to my mother. I have a funny feeling about going home. I don't know what it is. At night, I dream about it, and something keeps telling me to go home. I want to go to an institution now and learn to do fancy work and to be good, and then I want to go home. End quote. 
Libby told us enough about her first father for us to know he had had a terrifically bad influence upon her. She also long associated with bad companions who instructed her thoroughly in the ways of immorality. She described attacks in which she felt weak and thought she was going to fall, but never did. The young child in the family who had epilepsy was no relation whatever to her. She knew that her mother had long been living with her stepfather in common-law relationship, but insisted on what was undoubtedly the truth, namely, that they were temperate and were respectable people. Libby never gave us any explanation for her testimony against her mother, but acknowledged that she herself had been delinquent earlier. The physical examination showed a normally developed girl, weight 108 pounds, height 5 feet 3 inches, well-shaped head and rather delicate features. Her teeth showed a defective line in the enamel near the gums on the incisors and the cuspids. Bites her fingernails. Slight irregularity of the left pupil. Careful examination of the eyes in other ways entirely negative. Prompt reaction of pupils to light. No sensory defect of importance. Knee jerks active. Heart sounds normal and all other examination failed to show defect complained of frequent headaches, but these were not of great severity. After information from the mother, we felt that Libby's feelings of weakness and tremblings were probably of the hysterical variety. During the period in which we had Libby under observation, she showed more or less emotional disturbance, but even so we were able to assure ourselves that her mental ability was fair. We did not expect good results from formal education because in her case it had been very irregular. Many of our ability tests, however, were done well, but she failed where she was asked to demonstrate good powers of concentration and attention. We noted that she showed a very eager attitude toward her work, but was nervous about it, always pleasant demeanor. Most significant results were obtained on the Osage or testimony test. After viewing our standard picture, she volunteered only eight details in free recital. On cross-examination, she gave 21 more, but no less than seven of these were incorrectly stated. Then she accepted the four suggestions which were given her. This result from a girl of her age and ability was exceedingly poor. We never found any evidence whatever of aberrational mental conditions. Our final diagnosis was fair in mental ability with poor educational advantages. It should be definitely understood in considering this case that even to the time of our last interview with Libby, after she had acknowledged her own extensive prevarications, we had evidences of the unreliability of her word. In giving details, she never made any special effort to tell the truth, whether it was in regard to the date of her father's death or any other immaterial detail. We were inclined to classify her as a pathological liar, as well as a case of pathological false accusation. Her traits as a liar and a generally difficult case have, we learn, been maintained during her stay up to the present time in an institution for delinquent girls. From the fairly intelligent mother who cooperated well with us, we obtained a carefully stated developmental history. During pregnancy with Libby, the mother was run over by a bicycle, but was not much injured. The child was born at full term and was of normal size and vitality. Instruments were used, but no damage was known to have been done. Libby walked and talked early. A couple of times when she was an infant, she had convulsions, but never after that. From seven weeks until she was three years old, there was constant trouble on account of some form of indigestion. For a time at that age, she was in the hospital, but the mother was never told exactly what the trouble was. Her stomach was large. As an older child, she was subject to fits of anger when she could not have her way. She never had anything that was suggestive of epilepsy. Twice she fainted. Once was when she came home half frozen one winter's day. At 11 years, she had pneumonia. She menstruated at 14 years. The heredity and family history in this case is of great interest. Libby's mother went to work for her first husband's family in the old country. At about that time, this man's first wife died, but he had previously left her. He came of a good family. He was himself, however, a hard-drinking man. He left two children by his first wife with his parents and came to this country with Libby's mother. 
Here they lived in a common-law marriage relationship for many years, and two children, one of them Libby, were born to them. The man continued to be a terrible drunkard and was probably insane at times. He once bought a rifle to kill his family. He was notorious for his great changeableness of disposition. Sometimes he would be very pleasant and then quickly be seized by some impulse when he would grind his teeth, become very angry, and use vile language. Even when sober, he would go along talking to himself, and people would follow him in the street to hear what he was saying. He threatened often to kill his wife. He deserted her at times for months together. He only partially supported his family, and his wife worked as a washerwoman. She left him once, but later went back to him. In evidence of the character of this man and his wife, we have seen several statements from reliable people. The man's son, by his first wife, came to this country and lived with them. He found his own father impossible, a terribly bad man who was continually fighting at home. He himself urged his stepmother to break up the home on account of the way in which she was abused. He made a statement of this fact under oath. It is only fair to say, in this whole connection, that these people all came from a part of Europe where what we call a common-law marriage is an ordinary relationship. It was from the language of her father that Libby first gained acquaintance with bad sex ideas, we are assured by the mother. After a terrific time of stress, Libby's mother was rescued from her miserable conditions by the man who later lived with her and finally married her, and who has supported her and been true to her ever since. He is a sympathetic man of good reputation. Libby's maternal grandparents died early, and her mother had to begin very young to support herself. All that we know of the mother's developmental history is that she had some sort of illness with convulsions once as a child, and is said to have been laid away for dead. She has brothers and sisters who are said to be quite normal. She knows her own relatives and her first husband's also, and feels very sure there has been no case of insanity, feeble-mindedness, or epilepsy among them. Libby's moral history is of great import. She became definitely delinquent very early in life. At 13 years, she had already been in an institution for delinquent girls in an eastern state and the superintendent writes that she was notorious for disobedience, lying, and stealing. She was placed there twice, besides having been returned once after an escape. When she was six or seven years of age, she began thieving. She took things from her mother's trunk and pawned them. The child stole from the people's rooms where her mother worked as janitress. Later, she was truant and associated with immoral girls. In Chicago, she stole a bracelet and a ring from a downtown store, wearing the bracelet later. She took $15 from a neighbor's house. She went to saloons in company with an immoral woman, and at least on one occasion she had been drinking. At 12 or 13, she was known to be crazy about boys, but probably was not immoral then. The mother insists that the girl, resembling her father in this, is most changeable in disposition. Long before the trial for murder, her pastor had urged the mother to put the girl away in an institution, but the mother's heart was too soft. It seems strange that all this evidence of the girl's own bad character and unreliability, which was readily obtained by us, was not utilized at the time when she first made the charges of murder. The mother's explanation of Libby's behavior is that it was spite work. However, that is, of course, unsatisfactory. The mother, not long previously, earnestly had warned the girl against pursuing her downward path, and had stated she must be sent away again if she did not do better. Libby then was doing pretty much as she pleased, for the mother, who was all along a frail woman, sick much of the time, had really no control over her daughter. Another feature of the case that is interesting came out in the fact that Libby herself had neglected the little epileptic girl who died. When the mother was ill in bed, Libby had refused to properly care for the child. To some extent, she also engaged in bad sex practices with the little girl. Libby never gave us the slightest indication that her false testimony was incited by spite. Anyhow, she involved the stepfather, who she always insisted had been very good to her. The motive, undoubtedly, is not so simply explained. 
a really deep analysis of the behavior could not be undertaken case card case 13 girl 16 years mental conflicts about sex experiences and own misbehavior bad companions including father home conditions notoriously bad in early life heredity father alcoholic brutal and perhaps insane delinquencies false accusations extreme case stealing sex immorality etc mentality fair ability case fourteen summary a girl of thirteen during the last year or more had been lying excessively and in uncalled for ways she also obtained money by misrepresentation and had made false charges of sex assault against a stranger to be thought of as causative factors were defects of environment and possibly heredity markedly imperfect vision improperly obtained sex knowledge and a distinct mental conflict we were asked to study this emma x on account of the various social issues involved in her case her family found her beyond control she had been expelled from school by her false accusations she had created much trouble for the police in her home town officials of a public welfare agency found her altogether difficult to understand we obtained an account of the case from several sources including the mother the trouble with her had begun about a year previously she had been notoriously untruthful and had forged a relative's name to the extent of obtaining forty dollars in small sums emma remained out late in the evening sometimes and on three occasions stayed out all night the first time this happened she came home scratched and untidy and told a sensational story which led to much newspaper notoriety she said a man took her to the woods this was in the summer time and kept her there all night a loafer in the town who was arrested the next day she positively identified as the one who had assaulted her this man was later discharged in the police court however because he abundantly proved an alibi and because by this time the girl's story had become so twisted that even the mother did not believe it a physician's examination also tended to prove that no assault had been attempted after this emma was known to sleep one night in a cellar coal bin in stealing and general lying she became worse until with a change of residence to an uncle's home she improved for a time it was after a little backsliding that we saw her the mother frankly tells us that the girl's mind must be affected otherwise how could she act as she does emma has complained frequently of headaches and of a little dizziness she has lately been lonely for a sister who went away for the last two years emma has not seemed altogether well she has been nervous a time ago she had for a friend a girl who spoke too freely with men and her mother stopped the companionship this other girl had a sister in industrial school emma's mother does not know of any definite harm done by the companionship during the pregnancy with emma the mother had a rather hard time for a while on account of the severe illness of another child the pregnancy began when the mother was still nursing a baby however when emma was born she proved to be a healthy and normal child birth was normal no convulsions first walked and talked at the usual age she was a fat child until eight years and then after an attack of pneumonia she began to ail somewhat at ten years tonsils and adenoids were removed the mother had no knowledge of emma's defective vision emma started to school at seven years but at thirteen had reached only the fifth grade there are eight children in the family one died in infancy there has never been much illness among them most of them did well in school the family physician says the boys show a quote, queer streak but nothing evidently at all well defined as compared with the career of emma whom he characterizes as a quote, moral pervert the mother is a well-meaning hard-working moderately intelligent woman of about forty-five she is said to be somewhat slack in her household but perfectly honest the father is desperately alcoholic and peculiar at times it is not known that his aberrations are ever shown apart from his drinking years ago he was in a hospital for the insane for several months as an alcoholic patient the trouble with this girl is said to have led him to drink again 
Both parents were from immigrant families. It is positively denied that there are any cases of insanity, feeble-mindedness, or epilepsy on either side. Some other members of the family are known to have better homes. On the physical side, we found a small child for her age, weight 81 pounds, height 4 feet 9 inches, nutrition and color fairly good, vision about 2080 in the right, 2060 in the left, never had glasses, crowded teeth, high gothic palate, regular features, expression peculiarly stiff with eyes wide open, flushes readily, with encouragement smiles occasionally, other examination negative tonsils and probably adenoids removed three years previously formerly had trouble with breathing through the nose complains much of frequent frontal headaches says she gets dizzy often in the schoolroom our psychological impressions dictated by dr bronner state that at first we found emma very quiet and diffident possibly somewhat shy and timid at best she did not talk freely only in monosyllables as a rule she appears rather nervous. She says she thinks of lots of things she does not speak of. Emma smiles in friendly enough fashion and later became more at ease and more talkative. She was rather deliberate in work with tests. With concrete material she did better than with tasks more purely mental. She succeeds eventually with nearly everything but is slow. She seems anxious to do well but acts as if unable to rouse herself to any great effort. She is quite inaccurate in arithmetic and only fair in other school studies. Emotions normal. In many ways appears normally childish. Her interest in fairy tales and in the type of make-believe plays in which she engages with her younger sisters seems mixed with her wonderment in regard to sex life. There is a distinct tendency to daydreaming. In reviewing the results of the tests, the only peculiarities to be noted are a definite weakness displayed in the powers of mental representation and analysis. She failed on test X, usually readily done at 12 years, and a rather undue amount of suggestibility and inaccuracy in response to the Osage test, test 6. The latter, naturally to be supposed important test, in a case where lying was a characteristic, showed a result that belonged to the imaginative, inaccurate, and partially suggestible type. Many details of the picture were recalled correctly, but a few were manufactured to order, and four out of seven suggestions were accepted. About the general diagnosis of mentality there could be no doubt. The girl had fair ability, but there had been poor educational advantages on account of extremely defective vision no signs of mental aberration were discovered. Our attempt to try to help Emma decide why she got into so much difficulty resulted in a more convincing discovery of beginnings. We found a keynote to the situation in asking her about the companionship which the mother had said she had broken up. It seems that Emma had for a year quite clandestinely been familiar with this family. She apparently now desired to reveal the results of the acquaintance. Long ago, the older sister, at present in a reform school, boasted of her escapades with boys. Emma stated that she herself never talked of these topics with her mother, who had said that girls who don't do such things should not talk about them. But Tessie, the younger sister of the delinquent girl, says many bad words about boys. These words and ideas about them bother Emma much. They come up in her mind, quote, sometimes at night and sometimes in the day, end quote. She even dreams much about them and about boys, quote, I seen the girls do bad things with boys. It is in the dream. It was in the house, in the front room, on the floor, end quote. Emma says she never saw it in reality, but Tessie had boys in their front room when she went there and then came running out when she heard Emma coming. She wonders just what Tessie does. Boys never bother Emma, but all these ideas bother her. Quote, then I think that the boys are going to do it to me. End quote. In school, she cannot study for this reason. Quote, sure, when I start to study, it comes up. I just think about what she tells me, Tessie. She tells me she'd like to do these things with boys. End quote. 
this little girl in the couple of interviews we had with her gave vent to much expression of all this which had perplexed her and she really seemed to want help she was very willing to have her mother told she went on finally to say that the delinquent girl had taught her long ago about masturbation and that she thinks of it every night in bed she can give no explanation of why she runs away and why she falsely accused the man she says it was not true at all what she said about him she thinks she would behave better if she were less bothered about the things which those girls taught her emma says she questioned a young woman relative who did not tell her any more than her mother did regarding her diversions emma says that she likes reading especially fairy tales she reads mostly anderson's fairy tales she enjoys dressing up as a grown lady and playing make-believe she particularly likes to go to bed early and lie and imagine things she imagines sometimes that she is grown up and married and has her own home and children the neglect through ignorance of the several genetic features of emma's case was quite clear the mother was made acquainted with the fact which her little daughter then affirmed to her and she promised to alter conditions we insisted on attention to emma's eyes and general physical conditions on removal from neighborhood association with these old companions on the necessity for motherly confidences on watchfulness to break up sex habits and on the development of better mental interests through relatives in the home town it seemed there was some chance to get these remedial measures undertaken a year and a half later we can state that a certain number of our suggestions were followed out the mother gained a better understanding of the case and there were some although not enough environmental changes the father's mental condition has been much better perhaps because he has largely refrained from drink and consequently family affairs are more stable the girl herself is said not to be doing perfectly either in school or home life but to be vastly improved we have obtained no definite statement concerning whether she now lies at all or not but it is sure that emma has engaged in no more egregious types of prevarications and in no more false accusations competent observers think the case is fairly promising in its general moral aspects if environmental conditions continue to improve case card case fourteen girl age thirteen mental conflict improper sex teachings bad companions home conditions lack of understanding and control father alcoholic insane question mark defective vision delinquencies false accusations runaway obtaining money by false representations mentality ability fair this is the end of part one of chapter four read by mary schneider Part 2 of Chapter 4, Cases of Pathological Accusation, in Pathological Lying, Accusation, and Swindling by William and Mary Healy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Case 15, Summary. Girl of 16, over a period of some weeks, made extreme accusations against several members of her family. She gave detailed account of sex immorality, alleged drunkenness, and thieving, and an attack on her life. She had herself, it was found, begun delinquent tendencies. The family circumstances and her clearly detailed account gave the color of possibility to her accusations, but investigation proved some of them false, and all of a sudden, after maintaining for long a most convincing demeanor, she withdrew her allegations. Both before and since this episode, she has given no marked evidence of being a falsifier. We were asked to study this case by police officials who thought perhaps the girl was the victim of some delusional state. She appeared at the police station and informed them her adult brother had been thieving from the place where he worked. She lived with him. Investigation by detectives on the strength of her convincingly given details proved his innocence. When the brother appeared on the scene, he said he had been intending to report her on account of her being away from home. She herself was then held in custody. 
we found a girl in very good physical condition well developed in sex characteristics and a very mature type of face outside of a somewhat enlarged thyroid and moderately defective vision we found nothing abnormal weight 114 pounds height 5 feet notable was her strong features deep-set eyes high broad forehead and sharp chin our study of her on the mental side led us to denominate her as having fair general ability she had had poor educational advantages we noted much irregularity on work on tests she did comparatively poorly on anything that called for careful attention and concentration this was especially notable when she was dealing with abstractions or situations to be mentally represented although she could do arithmetic up to simple division she made a bad failure in the continued process of subtraction as given in the crapelin test of taking eights from one hundred in the work on the code test eleven she found it altogether impossible to keep her mind concentrated in tests where perceptions were largely brought into play she did very well we noticed that she was possessed of a very dramatic manner she sighed frequently as she worked she was very nervous continually moving her hands and tapping the table she was quite satisfied with her superficial efforts it was very curious that we as well as others were able to note her apparent sincere belief in her own statements about her family as she made them she looked the interviewer straight in the eyes there was not a hint of evasiveness her result on the osage test six was very meager she only recalled ten details of the picture on cross-examination she gave correctly fourteen more items and was wrong on three of them she accepted only two out of five suggestions offered and these were the most probable ones a full family history was never to be obtained the best that we came ultimately to know was that her father and mother had been long dead and she had lived in institutions for years then with a relative who was not at all a good person and then with her brother and sister whom she bitterly accused these were people in decidedly poor circumstances and living in very congested quarters indeed we were inclined to believe finally that crowded housing conditions with the necessary unfortunate familiarity with sex affairs and the like was largely responsible for her trouble a few months prior to these events she had become acquainted with a girl who had drawn her into running away from home a few nights during her unsettled home life she had seen a good deal of immorality in other houses but had not been immoral herself conditions of squalor surrounded the whole situation her accusations against her family as told to others and reiterated to us involved the drunkenness of her own father and mother we were never able to verify whether this charge against her mother was true or not then she went on to allege extreme immorality on the part of her three sisters she gave these in the utmost detail there is little doubt but that one of her sisters was rather free living before she was married she constantly maintained that she was the only virtuous one in the family and had withstood all advances she then recounted much personal abuse and cruel treatment and accused the brother and his wife of an attempt to poison her because they wanted her out of the way her story was told in such detail was so well remembered from time to time and she presented such outward form of sincerity that experienced people were led to believe there must be much in what she said on one occasion under observation she cried nearly all of two days because one good woman would not believe her statements at least she said this was the reason of her tears her general behavior during this period of observation was perfect we found her hazy and somewhat incoherent about a number of the details of her life but she had lived under such varied circumstances that this alone was not convincing of her insincerity when we met her brother we were very sure that at least a part of her story was false he seemed to be a very decent fellow and was really interested in her several months earlier he had trouble with her on account of her staying out late at night and had threatened her then there was no more difficulty until her recent acquaintance with this other girl 
He stated that he had been obliged to scold her very severely, and then finally she stayed away for five nights and wound up by going to the police station and making the accusations against him and the other members of the family. When the case came up in court, she stated that she wished to go back to live with this brother and admitted having continued misrepresentations about him and the others in the family since her acquaintance with this girl. It really was all false. She was placed under probation and the case has been, except for environmental circumstances, entirely successful. She is now a young married woman and has had no further delinquent record against her. Our investigation of the causation showed perhaps self-protection from punishment for her own behavior, but there was apparently much mental conflict about sex affairs and she had a very unfortunate acquaintance with such details, resulting partly, as she acknowledged, from her peeping through keyholes, and so on. On account of her peculiar unreliability of statement, and many quiet and staring periods seen while she was under observation, we questioned whether she was not verging on psychotic conditions. However, all this tendency seems to have passed away. Case card. Case 15. Girl 16 years adolescent instability, home conditions, defective through poverty and congestion, early sex experiences and mental conflict about them, reaction to own delinquencies, self-protection phenomenon, delinquencies, false accusations, mentality, fair ability, poor advantages. Case 16. Summary. A motherless girl of nine and a half years, following her complaint of local symptoms, which proved to be due to vulvitis, accused her father and brother of incest. She was a bright child and normally affectionate, even towards these relatives. Her father and brother were held in jail for several weeks, but were dismissed at the trial because of the ascertained untruth of the charges as causative factors of her false accusations our study showed a her local irritation b for which her father had treated her c prior crowded housing conditions with her father and brother d her lack of mother's control e early and intimate acquaintance with atrocious sex knowledge and sex habits and f recently becoming the center of interest in a group of friends made through her statement of the vileness of family conditions we were requested to study this case by the judge of the court in which the father and brother of bessie m were to be tried for the crime of incest with her at a preliminary hearing the judge had felt that the remarkable statements of the little girl savored of untruth and that the character sustained by the brother in particular was quite out of keeping with grave accusations against him the girl's charges so clearly detailed together with her local ailment had proved thoroughly convincing to a group of women who had become interested in her bessie was evidently quite normal mentally and apparently affectionately regarded her only near relatives this father and brother her story appeared thus entirely credible. The judge stated that he had been approached outside of court by these women, who in their righteous indignation were insistent upon the need of dire punishment of the outrageous conduct of Bessie's natural protectors. We found a rather poorly developed little girl, weight 64 pounds, height 4 feet 4 inches, bright, pleasant, vivacious expression, attitude normal, high, prominent, narrow forehead, head length 19 centimeters, breadth 13 centimeters, slightly asymmetrical frontal bosses, snub nose, eyes fairly bright, ears asymmetrical in size, 0.6 centimeters difference in greatest length, thyroid palpable, tonsils enlarged moderately, no sensory defect of importance, strength good for size, color only fairly good, Results of gynecologic examination later. Bessie was given a wide range of mental tests with the result that we classified her as being well up to the ordinary inability. Indeed, considering her poor school advantages through frequent changes of residence, she did very well in the subjects covered by formal education. Her memory processes and ability to testify correctly, in which we were naturally most interested, seemed, so far as we were able to test them, quite normal. Of a standard passage about a fire, test 12, 
which she read once to herself she recalled seventeen out of the twenty items a passage containing twelve main details test thirteen which was read to her in the usual way four times she recalled with two details omitted the osage test test six was done very well indeed with seventeen items of the picture given correctly on free recital and five rejections out of the seven suggestions proffered bessie's conversation was fluent and coherent her range of information was good she showed fondness for the dramatic statement her mother died in the old country when she was about four years old and her father had immediately come to america but had never established a home of his own for the last nine months bessie had been living with a woman mrs s who was deeply interested in her previously to this she roomed for about six months with her father and brother and prior to that time she had been placed about in different homes by her father after some months with mrs s she complained of local pain and irritation when taken to a physician she said her father was accustomed to touch her and her story involved incest by both her father and brother after others had become interested in her case the matter was turned into the hands of the police it was notable that during the period bessie's love of the dramatic was being fostered by her newly found woman friend who was providing her with lessons in dramatic reading and taking her extremely frequently to movie picture shows and theaters when first seen by us bessie reiterated her story of sexual relations with her father and brother as she had done with others and with the judge she went into almost convincing details her knowledge of such relationships was apparently complete she informed us that she had caught an awful disease from her father she said that while rooming with them her sexual relations with her father and brother were nightly occurrences they all slept in one bed a careful inquiry into bessie's earlier knowledge of such things brought forth the most astounding account one may say that this little girl had the most extensive acquaintance with many kinds of pervert sex practices that one has ever known in a young individual she now said that the last ones who engaged in such things with her were her father and brother her experiences began at five years with a boy and a girl and she maintained they had been very frequent ever since up to within the last nine months a number of boys and girls were involved as well as the men in two households where she had been placed the practices she had engaged in were many running all the way from self-use of pieces of broom to normal intercourse and both active and passive forms of pervert practices it is unnecessary even in this medical case to go into details or to give her actual phraseology it is sufficient to say that she frankly stated her early discovery of the pleasures of local stimulation and how she asked others to give it to her in various ways then she performed different perversions on boys and men she told about observing sex relations between husband and wife in households where she had lived she now says she had a disease before she came home to her father a doctor had told other people previously the men in two homes frequently had complete intercourse with her she maintains and gives description of it the credible substance of bessie's long story elaborately told upon inquiry into her life history was that she certainly had had many sex experiences when in the light of these it finally came to the question of the charges against her father and brother she said it was really she who had been the instigator when in bed she had begun playing with them she described her method learned before she now says they did not have real intercourse with her but the other men did the account of local physical conditions as obtained from several sources is as follows bessie was taken to a physician for vulvitis etc by some people before she came back to her father during the period she roomed with her father he regularly treated her locally with a salve and a wash the physician who later examined her for mrs s found the parts so swollen that he could make no diagnosis of ruptured hymen but took it for granted after the father and brother had been in jail for some weeks the inflammation had subsided 
it is only fair to say that the father had clamored for a specialist's examination which he contended would prove his innocence of course he was not aware of her earlier experiences or he would not have been so sure then a competent gynecologist found that coitus had never taken place the hymen was intact this was at the time we studied the case on the day of the trial, I, with two other physicians, examined the girl. It was found that a cotton swab about three-eighths of an inch in diameter could with difficulty penetrate the vaginal orifice. There was not the slightest evidence of any rupture of the hymen or of any vaginitis. So far as the awful disease was concerned, repeated bacteriological tests over a considerable period failed to show the extensive vulvitis to be due to gonorrhea. It seemed much more likely that it was due to nonspecific infection following traumatism from the use of the various foreign objects which the girl told she had used. Perhaps it was partly the result of the perversions which, judging by her knowledge of them, had been practiced by others on her. We were informed later that much indignation at our report to the judge was expressed by the crowd in attendance at the trial. The girl's first story was so well told that many had been irrevocably convinced of the utter guilt of the father. The father himself, who was brought to us in the course of our study of the case, was rather a low type in appearance. He was a poor earner, evidently had earlier been alcoholic, a small whining figure with tears in his eyes. His appearance would prejudice against him. The brother, on the contrary, made an unusually good impression. He had the best of recommendations. His sister's first charges ought not to have been believed on the basis of his qualifications. There had been five children, three died in infancy. No history of any significance was obtained, except that the development of Bessie had apparently been normal in all ways. Her mother was said to be normal. Both parents were evidently representative products of the underfeeding and generally poor hygienic conditions of the laboring classes in a large Irish city. There was unquestionably a great feeling of affection between the three. Indeed, Mrs. S. stated that it was the excessive kissing of the child by the father which made her suspicious. Bessie always maintained that both father and brother treated her very well and that she loved them much. It seemed clear to us that Bessie never knew in the least the significance of the charges she so glibly made at first. Her mind had long been so full of these things, and their social import seemed so slight that it meant no vindictiveness towards her loved ones to say what she did about them. She asserted to us later that she really did not know what she said to the judge at the first hearing. The case illustrated well the fallibility of a young girl's accusations coming even from the lips of a normally bright and affectionate daughter or sister. For her own protection, Bessie was given a trial in an institutional school. From there it was reported after a few months that her mind was found to be so continually upon sex subjects that it would be most advisable for her to remain long under the quietest conditions and closest supervision. Case Card Case 16, girl, age 9.5. Physical conditions, local irritation. Housing conditions, crowded early sex experiences, excessive and pervert, parental control failure, no home, no mother, delinquencies, serious false accusations, mentality, good ability. Case 17. Summary. Boy of 16 years, not living at home, made false accusations of excessive immorality against his own family. These involved sex perversions, and he implicated even his own sister and brother and alleged the connivance of his mother. The main complaint was against the stepfather, who he also said was a professional thief. The improbability of such stories being told without good foundation led to much time being spent on investigating the case. As possible causative factors of the unmitigated line we found a. defective heredity leading to b typical constitutional inferiority with the peculiar states of mind characteristic of the latter c poor developmental conditions through early illnesses d excessive bad sex practices on the part of the boy himself vindictive reaction to charges of delinquency against himself 
might be considered a factor if his false accusations had not been made without any such stimulus a long time previously according to another classification this case belongs in our chapter on borderline types it is retained here because it so well illustrates pathological accusation john s is an undersized boy of sixteen a pitiable specimen when under arrest for vagrancy told such a heart-rending story of home conditions with assertions against family morality that the judge and others were moved to indignation and an investigation was started the general feeling was that no one who was not insane could make such statements about their nearest of kin without foundation in fact we found a poorly developed but fairly nourished young fellow weight 112 pounds height 5 feet 2 inches good strength for his size stigmata slight facial asymmetry ears very long and narrow dentition very irregular one upper canine having erupted behind the central incisor tattooing on the chest vision defective but how much so was impossible to estimate on account of corneal ulcer and gonorrhea ophthalmia gait and attitude very slouchy in contrast to general poor development has already full sex development and much hair over body for his age on the mental side we found an excitable and talkative fellow quite coherent and giving in no way any indication of aberration by the form or trend of his conversation he tells us he reached the sixth grade he willingly works on tests and we note the general result as follows learning and memory processes both for logical verbal and for meaningless associations quite good perception of form normal power of analysis of situations mentally represented only mediocre associative processes verbal not normally accurate writes good hand simple spelling correct arithmetic correct for fourth grade tests for several other points hardly fair to register on account of defective eyesight on one he failed because of not knowing the alphabet in order suggestibility extreme as evidenced by testimony test in giving report on the osage picture test six he enumerated twelve items eleven of them correct on free recital then he gave eleven more details all correct on cross-examination but he accepted no less than seven out of eight suggestions offered information on current events is good but on points said to have been learned at school is much mixed up in giving responses to questions he seized on any slight suggestion and adopted the idea for instance he said he read the life of napoleon but could not remember to which country he belonged when england was suggested he agreed to it he then told various wrong incidents of napoleon's life and death also as suggested by the examiner it finally came out that bonaparte was an english nobleman who fought against france and waterloo was never defeated and got sick in england then in the same way we get the information that this country gained its freedom from france that lincoln was president directly after washington and so on john has read books from the library and various magazines a considerable assortment he knows almost nothing of even simple scientific facts but is well acquainted with items gained from the newspapers and the theaters going into his story as we were requested we heard at once about the cruel conditions at home the boy's own father had been dead for ten years and up to within three years he had lived with a relative while he was there letters indicated that queer things were going on at home and the stepfather was cruel to the other children the mother was afraid to tell the whole story when the boy came home the stepfather at once began pervert sex practices with him horrible things and john found this man had been doing deeds of the same kind with an older sister and a younger brother it seems the stepfather also beats the children and has put this older girl out of the house recently he has left his wife when we go into john's own record with which we had already made ourselves acquainted he tells us he does not know what gets into him but he has run away from home no less than eleven times he works for a while takes his wages and then stays at a hotel 
He says he has been arrested several times on this account. His mother always telephones the police about him, and that is why he is under detention now. He wishes he were at home. The next day we went into more of the details which had been liberally sketched to the judge and other officials. We now learn that the stepfather is a professional thief and that stolen goods he has taken are to be found in their home. He often leaves home and perhaps takes his wife's wages. She has to work out and just now is again living at a hotel. The family have been informed by a physician that he is probably crazy. On a later occasion, the boy told my assistant that he wished to relate the whole story of his family. He then describes how the stepfather even blackens the eyes of the sister and that he has long been immoral with her. It now appears that perversions began between this man and John some two months ago, never before that. The mother is there in the house all the time and knows about and permits the stepfather's immorality with daughter and son cross-questioned afterward the boy evidently remembering what he had said before states these practices with him began the night he came home three years ago but they had been going on with his sister before that he knows this because his mother wrote and told him about it his uncle wrote and told her to put a stop to it but the stepfather intimidates her with a revolver our notes state that one afternoon when tests were being given him john seemed to be in an excited state and often interrupted the procedure with talking seen in the hallway soon afterwards he waved his hand and insisted on telling more about home conditions and about what the officers would find if they went up there on still another occasion he reiterated the same things giving many details it was about this time that john was found to give strangely fantastic and childish accounts of circumstances with which he had been connected we transcribe his story of a celebration at a school it is a good example of his tales Quote, they had it on lincoln's birthday and on the fourth of july too the teacher did not believe that abraham lincoln freed the slaves the children said oh yes he did but they did not believe it the children all hollered and said yes he did then they all ran up on the platform and got to fighting about it the teachers would not believe that lincoln freed the slaves till an old soldier came up there and told them yes he did do it End quote. i questioned him about this matter whether it was only a play they had or were they in earnest quote, oh all in earnest and they had a fight about it the teachers would not believe that abraham lincoln freed the slaves and the children all ran up on the platform and had a fight about it End quote. Home conditions were next looked up by a court investigator, and we came to know the mother and sister. Much to our surprise, we found them to be quite self-respecting, entirely credible people of good reputation in the neighborhood. The mother is an honest, hard-working woman and is exceedingly depressed about the career of this boy. The sister is a modest and unquestionably good, self-supporting young woman not a word was heard against them in any way in their distress they gave us the full story the parents were immigrants when young the father died through an accident some ten years previously the mother had kept track of the members of both families fairly well she had a sister insane said to have become so as the result of the menopause the father himself had occasional attacks of epilepsy but they were never frequent enough to hinder him working as an artisan he was a very moderate user of alcohol the mother had always been fairly healthy thinks she now has a cancer there are no other significant points in heredity that she knows there are three living children a number of miscarriages came after john was born the pregnancy and birth were normal john walked and talked very early never any convulsions at about two years of age he was very low with a complication of diseases he was sick at that time for three months later he was operated on for rupture the trouble with his eyes is of recent origin when he was a young boy in school a teacher once told her she did not consider him right mentally there has been an exceeding amount of trouble with this boy he was a great truant and reached only the fourth grade when he was living with the uncle he caused much trouble and the uncle warned her 
he has run away from home twelve times stays away perhaps two weeks at a time and comes home ragged and filthy he has had many jobs but stays only a day or two at work he steals in petty ways takes money from home when he runs away he is very lazy but a great reader especially of cheap novels among the troubles with this boy is his extremely filthy talk he has even lost one position on account of this an aunt caught the boy in bad sex practices several years ago and told the mother neighbors and earlier the school people warned the mother that this was what was the matter with the boy about a year ago john was found in a room with a man and other boys engaged in bad practices the man was sentenced to a long term in the penitentiary on account of it worst of all the mother says the boy is the most malicious liar she has ever heard of they have had a frightful time with him on account of this for over two years john has been telling bad stories about the stepfather recently he could not stand it any longer and left the mother he was a good and rather strict man who took much interest in the children he tried rewards with john but this was of no avail the boy has destroyed the home life but she thought it her duty to try further with her own flesh and blood the sister is in utter despair about what john has said concerning her the younger brother also feels great humiliation the boy has told his worst stories about them even in their own neighborhood after our investigation the boy was sent to an institution for delinquents where he could have the best of treatment for his ailments the report from there after a few months was that he proved to be an exceedingly weak and vacillating type he was notorious for being a boy that would do anything that was suggested to him an outlook was kept for signs of insanity but none was noted over three years later we hear that john's character has not shown any radical change as demonstrated by his mode of living he has served at least one term in a penal institution for adults we do not know anything further about lying or false accusations in the case case card case seventeen boy age sixteen constitutional inferiority stigmata heredity father epileptic maternal aunt insane masturbation plus pervert sex experiences developmental much early illness delinquencies false accusations excessive running away repeatedly stealing sex perversions vagrancy mentality dull from physical causes question mark beginning psychosis question mark pathological liar question mark this is the end of part two of chapter four read by mary schneider This is part three of chapter four, Cases of Pathological Accusation, in Pathological Lying, Accusation, and Swindling, by William and Mary Healy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mary Schneider. Case 18. Summary. Little girl of seven makes false charges of sex assault against boy in the same institution. She is later found to be an excessive liar and to steal. Causative factors A. Atrociously immoral home environment B. Early sex experiences C. Local irritation from active gonorrhea This case illustrates the fact that a young girl who has had unfortunate sex experiences, especially if her mind is kept dwelling on sexual subjects, through bodily irritation is apt to take advantage of the stir which she knows she can make by her statements and glibly make false accusations the case offered no difficulties for study and can be presented in short as typical of a number of similar cases seen by us we were asked to see this girl a few days after she had been taken from very bad home conditions and temporarily placed in a good institution for dependent children while there she had much upset the high-minded superintendent and her helpers by stating that an older boy in the place had sex relations with her she was small bright-eyed vivacious child general physical conditions decidedly good no sensory defect well-shaped head weight fifty-five pounds height four feet 
active gonorrheal vulvovaginitis. On the mental side, we found, although she spoke in somewhat broken English, an ardent conversationalist. With her many ideas about many subjects, she appeared decidedly precocious. We noted her also to be very defiant and self-assertive, and her tendency to lie without rhyme or reason was soon discovered. Her exact age never was ascertained, but undoubtedly it was about seven. She was in the second grade. At times, when doing the Binet tests, inhibitions would appear, and she would give no answer at all, even to some easy questions. Her positive responses graded her at six and two-fifths years, but undoubtedly she could have done much better had she so wished. In her talkative way, she used English very graphically, but with curious misuse of pronouns and a few other words. Considering the fact that her family spoke a foreign language at home, and she had been but a short time in school, this was not strange. Her lack of veracity was shown even in her assertions about her inability to understand English. At the first approach, she denied her ability to do so, but later showed that she understood very well. This behavior was of a piece with her attitude shown in doing the Binet tests. Quote, police bringed me, don't know why, cause my father run away, she don't want to stay with my mother, my father Austrian, sometime my father talk Italian, then God make him sick cause she talk Italian, my neck is sick, I go to Italian church and I talk Italian and God makes me sick, they bringed me home today, then they bring me back here, and then I stay here a long time. Question. What is the matter with you? A big boy up in school upstairs, don't know his name. I came Saturday, she came Saturday, she came Sunday too. When we come to listen to music, then she gave me that disease. Papa is bad. She run away, she run away. She take from my mama twelve dollars, all the clothes. She got another lady. Is that your lady? Why do you write? I would write better than you because I go to school all the time. I never take money. I Catholic and Catholic can't tell a lie. Well, I'm going to tell truth now. I found it in bed in paper inside. Then I give it to the teacher and then I give it to the nurse. I never tell lies. End quote. Before we had seen her, this child had given some sort of description of a big boy in the institution who she said had assaulted her. There was no such person there, but her vehement statements caused much disturbance. Later, she denied this to us and accused somebody at her own home. She came from miserable environment, as may be surmised from the fact that her father was a deserter and probably immoral. On account of her unreliability, nothing could be done in the way of prosecuting the offender. We always felt it a possibility that some member of her own family was guilty, and that was the reason she had told so many different tales about it. An owner was not found for the money which she had stolen. The person from whom she said she had taken it had not lost it. She took it under conditions when she had no chance to spend it. Her excessive lying was a continual source of trouble as long as she was kept in this institution. She was long treated in a public hospital for her gonorrhea. Since then, she has been lost track of. It is interesting in this case to note that the child maintained that she belonged to a church, which made it impossible for her to tell lies. We have heard almost exactly this same assertion on numerous occasions. It is clearly made by way of affirmation when the offender covertly feels the need of bolstering up false statements. Case Card Case 18, girl age 7, early sex experiences, bad companions, physical conditions, local irritation, home conditions, father immoral and deserter, heredity, father as above, delinquencies, stealing, sex, lying, false accusation, mentality, fair ability. Case 19, summary girl of 18 made accusations to officials that a lawyer for whom she worked had been immoral with her. About the same time, it was found that she herself had been stealing and lying about other matters. Later, when there was reiteration of the charges, a physician's examination showed that she had not been immoral. 
Some months afterwards, she went to other officials and insisted she ought to go to a reform school. A year still later, she did have sex experiences and contracted venereal disease. Her succeeding record is totally different. For several years now, she has been a young woman of thoroughly good character. In its progress, after extended exhibition of exceedingly erratic conduct to complete stability, now long observed, this case is of considerable interest. It was after some months of effort on the case by experienced social workers that we were asked to study this girl. We found no difficulty in rapidly becoming intimately acquainted with her conditions and troubles. Physically, she was a normally developed young woman of distinctly good strength, but slouchy attitude. In expression rather dull and pleasant, laughs much in rather childish way for her age weight one hundred ten pounds height five feet two and a half inches no sensory defect good color mentally we gave her a wide variety of tests with the result in general that she did well on them she had left school at fourteen years when in the seventh grade but had not forgotten what she had learned her arithmetic was done very well indeed and she wrote a very good hand the tests which brought her abilities in many directions into play were done almost uniformly well her memory processes were distinctly good and showed her capacity by her remembering logical connections as well as details her casuistic responses which were asked for in two moral situations verbally presented test twenty one were rather vacillating but evidently sound it was easy for her to appreciate the intricacy of the situation. On the Osage experiment, test six, out of the fifteen details given, as remembered from the picture just seen, two were imaginary, and of nine more items given on cross-examination, two were erroneous. Her account as given was functional, not at all enumerative, as in the usual childish fashion. Out of six suggestions proffered, she accepted four. This was a poor result for a person of her age. Her range of information was normal. Her interests while at home had been very simple. For instance, she had not been allowed to read novels nor go to theaters. In all our work on tests and in our several interviews with her, we never discovered any signs of aberrational tendencies. Her social conduct furnished the only evidence of erraticism. This young woman's mother, who is said to have been a normal person, died a few months before we knew her daughter. She had long been ill, and consequently it had very imperfect control over her daughter all through adolescence. The father had been dead for several years previously. He was a storekeeper, in a small way, fairly educated and non-alcoholic. No other family history of importance was ever forthcoming. There was only one other child in the family, a younger brother, who was quite normal. Outside of bronchitis during infancy, it was said this girl had never had any serious disease. In the last few months, there had been much complaint about suffering at the menstrual period. Menstruation began at 13 years of age and was said to have been regular until seven months or so prior to the time when we first saw her. However, this latter statement was made by the girl herself, and at this stage her word was not particularly reliable. When we began study of this case, we were put in possession of the following notes made by an unusually competent social worker, extending over the previous nine months. Attention was first drawn to her when she was living with someone who had offered to give her a home while her mother was mortally ill in a hospital. She then had clothing and trinkets, the possession of which she could not satisfactorily explain. It was discovered that she was lying. It was about this time that the girl told her friends that she had been immoral and accused a man for whom she had worked of being responsible for her downfall. She had also been flirting with a married man who had been talking to her about eloping with him. It was learned that she stayed all one night at a downtown hotel, but probably alone. Further investigation showed she had stolen a considerable sum of money from an acquaintance and also a watch. Then a physical examination was made and a certificate given that the girl had not been immoral. Much trouble was taken about the case in the ensuing year. The notes naively say, quote, object being to see if the girl could not be reclaimed. End quote. 
She was given an unusually good opportunity with a sterling family. She made much trouble for them and others who were interested in her. Her mother died early in the period. On a number of occasions she left her place and stayed away all night, sometimes walking the streets. On one occasion she is reported to have gone to a certain agency, looking as if she had been recently intoxicated, and appealed to be sent to a reform school. She was taken in by the police on one occasion. We first saw her after she had been living in this good home for several months. At the time we studied her physical and mental conditions, we attempted to make some analysis of her self-orientation. She maintained then that her main trouble was because she had got mixed up with this married man. She declared he threatened her. This was very likely from what was discovered about his character. She had very good words for the officials who had helped her so much. She told us how she had stolen a matter of one hundred dollars or so. When we questioned her about her early accusations, she said that she did tell a lot of lies when her case first was looked into. Quote, I thought they were too inquisitive. I thought if I told them a few lies, they would leave me alone. Everybody has to know everything. I forget half of what I'm to say. I don't know why I stole that watch. I would have brought it back home if he had not taken it on me. I never told anybody that I wanted to go to reform school. I was afraid to go home because I was afraid I would get a good scolding. I think I have told all the truth to the officers since the first. I was ashamed to tell it. That's the whole truth. That's the truth. There was no one with me this other night. I did not meet a soul I knew. I went out to the South Park. I had never been there before. Where I have been living, they would not let me go out anywhere. I had to stay there Sundays and all the time. When I got out, I was worse than a wild calf. Maybe if I went out oftener, I would not be so bad. I am here now because I went to the police station and told them I would not go home. It was late and I was afraid to go home. I had stayed out on the street all night. One night I went home and it was dark and I was afraid to ring and I stayed on the street all night. I was on the street all the next day, too. I went to the cemetery. Late that afternoon I met a young man and stayed talking to him and a detective came along and told us we shouldn't stand there. I never did anything bad with any man. I never said so. A visiting nurse told me the dangers of life. My mother told me I should be careful. Oh, I worked for that lawyer before my mother died. I worked for him about two weeks, and he did not pay me what he owed me. No, he never did me any harm. A man came along with a lady from that office, and he asked me some questions, and I was so scared because I thought they were going to lock me up. I guess that was the question, maybe, and I said yes but I did not know just what it was." End quote. It was just after this that the girl gave much trouble because of queer little trickery concerning some insurance papers and about losing some money. Her friends wasted much time in the endeavor to get these matters adjusted. The family she was with thought she was very childish for her age. Our opinion, as dictated at that time, was that the girl was physically and mentally all right, but that she showed a decidedly childish reaction towards the world and was very suggestible and unreliable. We knew many more facts about her which proved these points. Our judgment set down was that she was an unstable adolescent with possibility of showing very different characteristics inside of a year or two. We noted she had a weak type of face. She was seen four months later after a period of having run away twice for several days at a time. On inquiry, she maintains she was impelled to do it by her own feelings of restlessness and general dissatisfaction. She thought the people with whom she lived were very nice and only strict as they should be. There was some question raised about this time about the periodicity of her impulsions, but except for her own statement that it was just before her menstrual time, nothing definite was proved. On the last occasion, she did pick up with a young man and was immoral with him. She stayed out in a hallway all night. A venereal disease was then acquired. This was speedily treated in a hospital, and the girl was found another place. Three years have elapsed, and during that time this girl has continued under the observation of one of her old friends. 
she has remained steady and trustworthy and shows no tendency whatever towards untruthfulness or evasiveness she has lived in one good home for two years and the people are deeply attached to her case card case nineteen girl age eighteen adolescent impulses lack of self-control sex temptations resisted lack of parental care deficient interests both mental and recreational delinquencies false accusations stealing general lying staying away from home mentality good ability case twenty summary a girl of almost sixteen years of attractive and innocent appearance alleged that she had been leading an immoral life and frequenting houses of assignation she told the story to the people of her church who were naturally horrified and demanded a thorough investigation of the social vice problems involved this was undertaken by the police authorities but they failed to get any satisfactory evidence from the girl it was later found that the story was all a myth and the girl had not been in the least immoral her first statements followed directly after her attendance at an emotional revival meeting where these topics had been preached about afterward this girl was in court many times for various reasons she is a mild psychoneurotic type exhibiting under stress unusual mental phenomena she and her family have created an astonishing amount of trouble in law courts as both defendants and complainants because their peculiar unreliabilities have not been understood this case has been under observation and we have much information concerning it it was found difficult to understand by pastors and others who had given considerable attention to various aspects of it annie f was first seen by us when under custody because of her own statement that she had been leading an immoral life we have seen her and members of her family many times since the account of the case can best be given not by commencing in the cross-section study as obtained at first but by going at once into its whole connections and evolution at first it was merely learned that we had to do with an unstable adolescent girl who had engaged for apparently no purpose whatever in false self-accusations which would naturally blight her career on the physical side we found a rather slight girl however of normal development weight one hundred two pounds height five feet three inches no organic defect was ever discovered neurological examination showed as follows no tremors tendon reflexes normal conjunctival and palatal reflexes absent the sense of pain to pinpricks was almost nil on the arms and diminished on the face strength poor in the arms even when there was evidently great effort made several of these functional findings however have varied from time to time in the ensuing years hearing normal ocular examination showed hypermetropia 1.5 d r and l with marked astigmatism fields and color vision normal left pupil about twice the size of the right a competent oculist could find no evidence of organic affection of the nervous system correlated with this shape of head normal bowels regular appetite capricious when first seen was anemic but later color was very good temperature was taken regularly but no significant observations made petite pretty features and unusually beautiful eyes complaint of frontal dull headaches soreness of scalp cold hands and pain quote, about the heart menstruated at fifteen years then much irregularity for two years several badly carious teeth and great crowding in a narrow upper dental arch this girl was several times observed during a period of about five years she developed into an unusually attractive young woman showing at times various mild nervous disturbances as well as character difficulties only occasionally has she worn the glasses which corrected her errors of refraction during this time she has not been severely ill she has a palpable thyroid which has hardly increased in size when last seen she was notable for a very clear skin 
good color, and bright eyes. Conjunctival and corneal reflexes much diminished. Palatopharyngeal reflexes quite absent. The headaches are said to have persisted during all the time we have known her. We have repeatedly attempted to summarize the mental status and functionings of this young woman, but our findings on tests and otherwise have been irregular and diverse. She reached sixth grade at 14 years, but had been absent much on account of sickness. When first seen, we found that she was already fond of Lytton, Scott, and Dickens, and that she was a great reader of the daily newspapers, dwelling much on accidents and tragedies. What we say about her ability must be based upon the best that she has demonstrated. Often, when seen, she has been in some mental state which has prevented her from doing or being willing to do the best that is in her. She writes a good hand, does long division promptly, and reads well. Her association and memory processes have been proved normal, but given a task to do, she is prone to show inhibitory pauses and other phenomena which interfere much with a satisfactory result. She has some little reputation of being able to give long, almost verbatim accounts of sermons which she has heard, but the accuracy of her report we have not been able to verify. She gave the antonyms of 20 words in average time of 1.4 seconds, which is a good record. There was one failure, but that was quite typical. At the end of 20 seconds, which is beyond the time of failure, she gave unhappy as the opposite of happy, adding that she had thought of that before, only she did not speak it out. Her tests for psychomotor controls were miserable ones. She was rapid in movement, but absolutely inaccurate and did not follow instructions. However, we felt that even this did not indicate her full ability, for she had capably held a position in a millinery establishment, where she was required to show manipulative dexterity. Perhaps the best statement of her performances is that she demonstrated great irregularities from time to time, and even at the same examination in her work on different tests. On account of her peculiar testimony against herself, her memory processes, and especially her performance on the Osage test, the case seemed of great interest. We found, as we stated above, in various ways, that her abilities to remember, when at her best, were normal, but using the Osage picture, we obtained only six details in free recital. She was sure that was all she saw in the picture. Then on cross-questioning, she mentioned nine more items correctly, and gave eight others much altered from the truth. No other item was added, but her report on these was almost illusional in its incorrectness. Of five suggestions offered, she accepted two of the least important, refusing the others entirely. This was a remarkably poor result for a girl of her age, but may not be indicative of her best abilities even on this type of work. Our final opinion was that she was not clearly subnormal in native ability. Annie has grown somewhat more stable as the years have gone on. Following our first acquaintance with her, we have known this girl to make serious false accusations against others, vide infra, and to again damage her own reputation by alleging herself to be pregnant when she was not. Her word on other matters all along has been found somewhat unreliable, but there has been no extensive weaving of romances such as those indulged in by typical pathological liars. Our original diagnosis of this as a case of pathological accusation upon the basis of mild hysteria, we have seen no reason to change. Both Annie and other members of her family are representatives of a most important type for court officials and all other social workers to understand. A great deal of trouble has been caused in several religious congregations by the unusual character of the behavior of these people. Also, the number of times they have been in courts, for various reasons, is astonishing. The history of physical and mental development merges closely with the story of evolution in the moral sphere, and all can be given together. 
on account of the mother having long been dead and the father being the peculiar man that he is there is some question about the truth of some of the details which have been given us but we have reason to believe that the main facts are true because they have been held to be true in the family circle generally and were not merely given to us verification of details would be very difficult because the family are distributed between europe and america and no relatives outside the immediate family are at hand the mother was in excessively poor condition at the birth of annie she had miscarriages preceding and following it is stated that the diagnosis of malaria was made and that the mother had convulsions both before and after confinement at the birth the prolonged labor and instrumentation were not known to have done any damage as an infant annie is said to have been frail but not to have had any definite sickness or any convulsions however at about annie's fifth year there began a long list of illnesses she had scarlet fever severely and also a number of other children's diseases at eight years she had an attack of muscular jerking and then had a number of successive attacks until she was fourteen years at one time she was in a public hospital for three weeks on account of this it was stated that this was chorea but of course we cannot be sure on this point annie was always regarded as a very nervous child she was frequently a somnambulist until she was about twelve she is very nervous before the onset of menstruation of recent years she has been an excessive user of tea at times before we first saw her she is said to have had twelve cups of tea in a day at times she was then suffering from sleeplessness and was wont to feel tired in the morning as a young child she had severe night fears seeing terrifying shadows upon the wall on account of her illnesses and her general nervous condition annie was very irregular in her school attendance however she reached sixth grade as to the family opinion of her mentality we hear that they have regarded her as being an odd type not lazy but irritable hateful and moody by spells her mother is said to be most irregular sometimes exceedingly good the other children find it difficult to get along with her because she slaps them so much at times she swears at the time of the revival meeting shortly before we saw her she is said to have come home from church in an hysterical state when in custody she was in rather a dazed condition where she was detained they say she acted as if she were stunned her memory did not seem at all clear nor has it ever seemed other than confused about the events immediately surrounding the main episode of her career she maintained she could not remember just exactly what she had said and her account of it contradicted that of her father as we afterwards learned from the church people it is undoubtedly a fact that her notions of self-accusation came from a sunday school session in which her teacher repeated what had been talked about in the revival meeting concerning the scarlet woman a day or two afterward the girl told that she herself was a scarlet woman she told it first to the teacher was then taken to the pastor when she reiterated the story and the police authorities were called in of course her story implied lack of home guardianship and consequently the whole affair was handled for some days by the police alone after the girl had given a very detailed description of her immoral life by the time we saw the father it had been ascertained that this girl had never been away from home a single night in her life and probably had never been in the least immoral sexually it is necessary to have knowledge of the heredity and environmental background to understand this case almost nothing is known of the maternal family after losing his first wife the father was twice married and even the third wife has divorced him he had a brother who after going insane and killing two laborers committed suicide his grandmother and probably also a cousin were insane two of his sisters were of a nervous and hysterical type and said to have attacks of aphonia a child by his second wife is epileptic this man gives a long account of his own defective heredity and of his own physical ailments 
he does not recognize the fact however that he also is mentally below par we have seen him on numerous occasions and known of his great activity in the courts and have attempted to size him up he is undoubtedly a constitutional inferior in poor general physical condition and subject to episodic mental states one would be inclined to call him a semi-responsible individual with mild delusions defective reasoning ability great energy in self-assertion and of combative disposition this latter shows itself in his voluble emphasis on the alleged ill-treatment of himself and family even by his wives he is never physically violent on account of false accusations whether delusional or not he got at least one pastor into a peck of trouble and strangely enough his wives have been involved in some other church embroilments when his own character was called severely into question on one occasion we were interested to enumerate an astonishing list of people and organizations which he stated had treated him and his family unfairly it seemed to us that during the last two or three years he must largely have lived in the courts to carry on his transactions there his concern for his daughter seemed genuine and her delinquency led him to seek the law more than ever some of the good people who have become interested in his affairs tell us that his is the strangest story they have ever heard his veracity is often in question on more than one occasion with us he has dwelled on his nervous states and on the fact that he is subject to times of mental confusion but he defends his own judgment and actions on all occasions with great vigor this most erratic father has nearly always sided with annie and offered excuses for her under all circumstances however she has stated that he was most difficult to live with on account of his quarrelling at home and general bad management of the household we know that at times he has been a seeker of newspaper notoriety from his conversations with us and with others we know that his mind dwells much on sex affairs and those things are frequently discussed in the home there has been much turmoil and quarreling in the family circle at least with the last two wives on several occasions the family have had to appeal for aid from the charities because none of them succeeded in making a living annie alleged that she was taught shoplifting by the second wife we regard this as being possibly true on account of the woman's general reputation the fact that they were desperately poor and that she drank at times the father has the ability to make a very good presentation of himself to use the best of language and he has had musical training enough to be able to give lessons annie herself has taken many lessons in music the after history of this case is instructive almost none of our suggestions were taken when our first diagnosis was made two years after we first saw annie she was placed in an institution for delinquents then having run away from home picked up a man on the street and stayed all night in a hotel with him at the institution the girl became very nervous and behaved badly and the authorities decided it was a poor place for her the father who at first wanted her placed there very soon decided that she should be removed it is very likely his attitude has something to do with her behavior there about this time annie worked in a millinery shop where she proved herself quick and skillful there she told stories again defaming herself she said she had had a baby and went into complete details such as giving the name of the nurse who had taken care of her and so on on account of this she was discharged later she told us she related these stories to get even with her father for if there was ever a hell on earth it was living with him about three years after our first study of annie the father himself brought a complaint against her of untruthfulness and general unreliability this was at one of the times when he was complaining bitterly of other people it seems he had lately tried to restrain her from leaving the house and she had cut his head open with an umbrella it was evident she had started downhill again and she was placed in a rescue home she now repeatedly told people she was pregnant and made charges against some man but these soon fell through because a little detective work showed she was corresponding with a boy and had very likely been immoral with him and others she was then making an attempt to lead a dual life maintaining she wanted to save some of the unfortunates with whom she was placed while at the same time entering into various escapades with them and others 
at this period a suicidal attempt was reported but we never had satisfactory proof of the genuineness of this annie was now regarded as being excessively delinquent a few months afterwards when the young woman was in one of her better moods and wished to do well we made a few vocational tests on her we found her quite unfit for the position of telephone operator which had been suggested for her psychomotor control appeared then decidedly defective however there was a great improvement on work done on intellectual tests three or four years previously although she had developed physically she now was a particularly good-looking young woman we felt she was quite unfit for work which demanded steady effort one trouble all along was the fact that she did not wear her glasses we advised then as we had advised at first a quiet country life for annie and other members of the family the constant stimulus of city conditions was too much for them again our advice was not taken and some months later the father came to us with a story of extreme poverty some recent attacks of unconsciousness on his part separation from his third wife and the information that annie was about to become a chorus girl even a final consideration of the general diagnosis in this case which has been so long observed by us does not seem to justify our including it among our borderline mental types application of the term constitutional inferiority seems a priori warranted by the family history and yet we have no proof that her physical and mental conditions as enumerated above are not the result of her many early illnesses and the excessively erratic environmental conditions rather than of causes which existed at birth on account of the peculiar inhibitory phases which arose nearly always during observation we never relied merely on the results of laboratory tests for our judgment and her success in some social situations has proved the wisdom of this our earliest feeling that we had to do with a temporary and mild psychosis was perhaps justified but further observation of her has led us to see clearly that she is not to be considered as a deeply aberrational type could she ever have been free from the extraordinarily upsetting home conditions one could have gauged much more accurately her mental capabilities as time went on the moral difficulties which were largely induced by home conditions led to mental as well as moral upsets which could be considered as little else than normal reactions to the situation her conduct lapses under the circumstances are no indication of any mental breakdown on the contrary it is clear by our own examinations and the accounts of other observers that she gradually has showed greater mental stability since writing the above we have had by chance the opportunity of getting some important information about this case from an entirely new source a person who knew the family many years ago corroborates the father's remarkable story of antecedents the father himself remains in about the same state of social incapacity annie now married to a young man with a long criminal record has a child her word has recently been found absolutely unreliable and testimony lately given by her in court concerning her husband was grossly false when it would seem that her interests and welfare demanded her testifying the truth concerning his non-support case card case twenty girl age sixteen mentality psychoneurotic heredity extremely defective developmental conditions defective antenatal conditions difficult birth earlier neurosis physical conditions earlier dental defects defective vision usually uncorrected stigmata of eyes stimulants excessive use of tea home conditions highly erratic and unstable many bad influences there excitement and suggestion from revival delinquencies self-accusations running away sex affairs mentality abilities average and as above case twenty one summary this case illustrates the fact that pathological lying and accusation may arise first during a period of special stress a young woman of nineteen after illegitimately becoming pregnant was found home after home by a charitable organization in each place she made false accusations of immoral proposals against someone in the family or neighborhood 
This created much trouble and lost her several good homes. Her lies persisted after an abortion had been secretly produced but it is to be noted that she now, as a sequel to the operation, suffered from irritative pelvic conditions. A short statement of this case will suffice to bring out the point that during a period of social and mental upset, pathological lying and accusations may be first indulged in. We studied the case of a young woman of 19 who had been the source of much trouble in a certain locality on account of her false accusations. She was taken in hand by a charitable organization and found a home. After she had become pregnant at a wedding feast where alcoholic stimulants flowed freely, there was then no one to look after her but an invalid father. She was placed with an estimable family. In a short time, she made the shocking announcement to the wife and to others that the husband had made immoral advances to her. He was a man of excellent character, and of course this could not be believed. She was then placed on a farm where she showed erotic tendencies and insisted that one of the helpers about the place wanted to take liberties with her. She was observed flirting and making advances to thrashers and others. She had to be found a new home, and this time it was in a city where new accusations were made against a delivery boy. After this, the young woman made off and shifted for herself for a time and succeeded in getting some shady character to produce an abortion on her. Later, she again came to the official attention of the social agency by reason of making new accusations. From the date of her impregnation to the time we first studied her, a period of about ten months, she had made serious accusations against many. When her lies were told in a new environment, they of course always made new trouble. Each time, however, the girl herself was the loser. Her real partner at the wedding feast had early deposited several hundred dollars for the expected infant. We found a strong, normally developed young woman of rather attractive appearance for the grade of society from which she came. No sensory defect, diseased tonsils, complained of constant suffering from pelvic conditions, perhaps induced by the abortion. However, being such a strong type, she has been able to get about well and do her daily work. When we saw her, she was employed in a factory. The question put to us was concerning her mentality. She came of a Slavic peasant family, had been in this country only six years, and her relatives spoke only Slavic. She had been to school but a very short time, either in the old country or here. Because of the language difficulty, the giving of many tests, such as those in the upper years of the Binet system, could be regarded as most unfair. However, the simpler language tests she did fairly well, especially those where she could understand the common sense questions. In regard to her acquirement of English, she has done better than her relatives who continue to live in a neighborhood where their own Slavic dialect is spoken. When it came to dealing reasoningly with concrete situations, such as those presented by our performance tests, this young woman did comparatively well, quite above the grade of the feeble-minded. Our diagnosis, then, was that she could best be regarded as poor in ability or possibly subnormal as compared with our general population, but as correlated with her peasant type, she was probably normal. From the standpoint of aberration, one could find no evidences of anything but eroticism and a constant tendency to deviate from the truth. About the affair of the abortion, she showed herself unexpectedly shrewd, maintaining that she had had to work very hard carrying stones when a new silo was being built on the farm, and at her next menstrual period she had flowed for a week or so, and that was all there was to it, except that she had been suffering from pains continually since. The charitable organization knew she had visited the office of a notorious abortionist. She smiled much in a silly way when in the company of men. She proved herself easily led. Taking it all together, there is no reason for considering her insane or as being in any way a psychopathic personality. She showed no stigmata of degeneracy. There was no opportunity to get a satisfactory family history. Many of the relatives were still in the old country. A sister and brothers had been known in the neighborhood where this girl lived and are said to appear quite normal in their simple ways of living. They are of the peasant type and good laborers, but given to occasional indulgence in feasting with alcoholic embellishments. From the sister, we learned that this girl had passed through a sickly childhood 
and had been most irregularly brought up on account of the illnesses of her mother she was not known as a liar when younger her short school record showed nothing of value for diagnosis what happened to this girl was no great exception among these people we know from their own accounts free and easy sex relations are common we are advised that it was long ago known that this girl was going with bad companions in this case we advised gynecological and other medical treatment and segregation in a reformatory or industrial school the young woman could be regarded as nothing else than a dangerous person in any community even when being brought to us she had endeavored to flirt with a conductor on the train a fair diagnosis could only be that she was for the present at least morally irresponsible this case has been only recently studied and no further report can be given it is cited in illustration of the fact that was not clearly brought out by our other cases namely that a period of stress may be very definitely the exciting factor in developing pathological lying and accusation this stands out particularly clear in this case because the young woman had prior to the wedding feast been a good worker and had given no trouble in the community this is the end of part three of chapter four and the end of chapter four as a whole recorded by mary schneider